Hello, everybody. Just going to say a few words to introduce Aradna to an audience of what I think is mostly young people and aspiring photographers, which I think is just the right kind of audience. She's actually, I find, quite hard to put into a box, to find a rubric to describe the kind of work she does, because she actually does so many different things. I, I first met Aradna when she um, appeared for a job as an assistant director, an AD, on a film that I was doing in 1988. The film was called In Which Annie Gives It Those Ones. Um, and this was a small budget film, uh, almost a no budget film. And as nearly always happens when you work with really small, tiny budgets, um, you tend to need to rely on the people who are working with you to a much greater extent, much greater degree, than would otherwise perhaps have been the case if you had an ample budget. And Aradna made a superb, superb AD, um, one of a very small band of people who actually worked to br hold that film together and bring it in. Um, we used to call her Jamia, um, because together with two or three other people on the crew, there were these fresh-faced young students out of the Jamia Milia um, Center for Mass Communication, which at that moment of time, 1988, was probably the only, am I right, the only institute in Delhi at that time. It was churning out people who were heading for cinema. But I think we were all a little worried that they were coming straight from a school into the frying pan, that they were still a little wet behind the ears, that they hadn't really earned their spurs actually working on a film with all the grime and dust and tension and you know all that goes with, with filmmaking. Well, they, they did earn their spurs. All of them were actually quite superb. But, and this particular Jamia um, was special. And um, we became very good friends. And I remember being really disappointed when roughly a year and a half later, she wasn't actually available to work on my next film uh, in 1990. Now, I think what should be of interest to a lot of young people working in the field today is that this period, 1988, 1989, 1990, was actually a very, very difficult time in our country to be trying to become a filmmaker. Um, if you were to ask Aradna what she was actually doing in 1990 or 1991, you'll find that along with a lot of other people, they were literally scrounging for work, scrounging in a way that perhaps young people today would not even understand. Um, the kinds of films, the kinds of places that were visited by young aspiring filmmakers to look for work would be, of course, Doordarshan, but also the UGC, the University Grants Commission, some other public sector undertaking perhaps, you know, and if you were very, very lucky then, perhaps something like UNICEF, but it was a very, very tough thing to be setting out to become a documentary filmmaker. But Aradna said at that time, and like a lot of other young people, took her chances, picked up little bits of documentary work, and um, you know, I asked Aradna before this talk, I said, you know, will you send me your list of films that you've done? And it's actually an astonishing document. It would take me 10 minutes to read out all the titles. Um, and it's, it's also the most incredibly varied uh, filmography you can imagine. It ranges from the diary of an Anganwari worker to a juvenile justice documentary for the University Grants Commission to a film on Insat 1B. It's really an almost amazing list. She's made over 20 documentaries in all. Most of it, but my, by no means all of it in the early phase of her career. And this was really just the tip of the iceberg in her case. Now I don't know if Aradna remembers this, but Sometime in the mid-90s, or perhaps a little later, we were discussing her work in film. And without thinking too much about it, certainly it wasn't a premeditated thought. I said, I asked her, I said, have you ever thought of working in the art department of a, of a movie? And perhaps, I'm not sure, but perhaps I just felt that good people weren't beating a path towards the art department, that this was one area, especially in new cinema, that wasn't populated by people uh, in India. Who, were, who made good art directors. And, um, you know, 20 years later, the result is that Aradna Seth now has 20 films, believe it or not, under her belt. 
the first few as an art director and then subsequently as a production designer. And she, she is now today definitely among the leading production designers in the country. Now, it doesn't stop there. Aradhana is also now a photographer and somebody who does host her own exhibitions. I once spent three days traveling with Aradhana in the desert in, uh, in Rajasthan. And we were both taking pictures and uh, using our cameras in very different ways. And I was astonished at Aradhana's ability to conjure up magic out of something that looked like nothing. It, it would be a light switch or it would be just a fan whirring against a pale ceiling. But I've never failed to be amazed by Aradhana's ability to see the wonderful in the ordinary. I'm not going to say very much more. I'm certainly not going to talk about her practice or her art. I'm going to give the floor to Aradhana now. But I just think that for young people in this audience who are struggling or aspiring to become photographers, let me just tell you that Aradhana is one of those people who is a shining example of somebody who doesn't hesitate to follow her heart, to do the things that she wants to do. And I just want to assure you all that that's all you need to be doing. It's not something that, it's not a big frightening world out there. The technology has become easier. The competition has become more difficult in some ways. But that's all you need to do. Thank you very much. Aradna, all yours. Thank you, Delhi Photo Festival, and Pradeep for that. Mm. Pradeep already mentioned that I work in multiple worlds, and I wanted to introduce that in the beginning of the talk. So I work as a photographer, a filmmaker, and a production designer, and feel that these roles cross-reference each other all the time. Rather than see myself as a master coordinator trying to interpret these distinct, though connected fields, I enjoy the process of working with each of them and using their specific skills and the interrelational way in which they work with each other. Mm, the lines are often very gray uh, between them and uh, there is a way in which the fluidity of these roles multiply possibly possibilities rather than make them ambiguous. I mean, there's always a way to take from one and move to the other the spatial life of the studio and the story in the script involves a transformation in which the image and the frame, no doubt, play a very important role, but at no point does the photograph cease being a photograph, the design of the object or space stop being that, and more importantly, nor does the film as a final product erase the distinct trajectories of these very specific skills. I thought I'd read out a little bit of what I'd written because I've been thinking about it for a few days on how to mesh the, t the three in a talk. In fact, I see the film as one more very exciting channel, as, as, existing, as exciting as the gallery space or the published monograph for showcasing my skills as a photographer or designer. The photograph for me is both a process of discovery and a laboratory for my imagination and has an ability to play these many roles. This may be an obvious point. After all, the frame is, is of course a very obvious reason why the camera is such an important tool for someone who will mediate design, sets, color through the lens of a movie camera. Everything, space, texture, light, dimensions, need to be processed through a frame for it, for it to make the transformation from reality as experienced, to, as experienced to reality and mediated by the screen. However, the camera is also more than a frame. It is a tool that I use in a very intense way. It's an extension of a doodle, a jotting, a random note. It becomes my archive, my, a diary, and a fountainhead of day-to-day -day dreams through which I go back to the studio, set or locations, with more ideas to play with. It is through this process that I find myself re-looking at some of the images as artifacts that have emerged from the same craft of making an image that, my, my, that any other photographer would play around with, 
So in a way, I'm working, making images, taking them back, using them for sets, and looking at them, and thinking about the work that I want to do, both from the seed of that or other seeds. Simultaneously, I kind of decide on newer projects, or mm, let's put it like this. I do that on one hand, and then I start, I make my own work separately. The creative moment can often be a, a byproduct that is unplanned, unintentional, way through which it emerges. I feel the more roles one takes on, the more one multiplies abilities in different directions, the possibilities of creative moments increase. They do not decrease. There's a strong impulse for us to reduce ourselves into one role. I'm a photographer, a filmmaker, a production designer, an artist in which we are encouraged to be the masters of that form. On this point, it must be said that even when people are talking about multimedia, the moment of genius is supposed to be showcased in but one space. Like and yet we all know that the creative moment, the actual production of the artifact, the work of art itself remains unpredictable and arbitrary. This is what makes it creative in the first place. These are basically my jottings and thoughts. So what I'm trying to say is I would like to acknowledge and share the byproducts of, of a variety of pro processes that go into the creative moment as being equally valid. I enjoy and have lived this multiplicity in my roles as filmmaker, production designer for movies, as pop-up studio architect. I've used the camera as a tool constantly of my trade, much as much as I've used it to make photographic work. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they are totally separate. So keeping these points in mind, I'd like to show you a series of images from one of my film experiences, the Darjeeling Limited, in which the camera has been precisely this, a tool through which many transformations have taken place, from a random observation in place X to its completely unexpected use in place Y. And in this process, I've continued to practice my craft. These are doodles, and these are photographs which I've taken, which are in the diary. So the, do the diary that I use every year has photographs that I've taken in it now. So this is a little jotting that I did one day while I was wandering around. And it appeared much later on the sets of the Darjeeling Limited. And the, uh, this is where it's, it's going up in a convent, which is um, far off in Udaipur, to show that it's a kind of, it'll be just in the background, but it was a doodle from one place that is now part of the filming of this set. And similarly, this one, this was a doodle, a jotting, and now it's, it was then used, we recreated it on the film set. And similarly, while we were, film, while we were preparing Darjeeling Limited, I saw this cow and I thought it would be interesting to have cows painted in the marketplace for our frame. And so we did that and this. Similarly, I've been constantly using photography in the photographic frame. So taking other people's work, this is a photographer called a Mallory Marder, whose photographs I put into a film we were working on, because often you have to showcase either somebody's home or a gallery or where, where, what places they would inhabit, and choose photog photography that is representative of those characters. Mm, there's a photograph right in the background on Bond Supremacy, which Dayanita Singh took, which is in that corner. This is on the right-hand corner, there's a photograph of J that Jim Welling took and Kathy O.P. So in a sense, parallelly, while uh, sort of jotting and making jottings, I was also put looking at photography in the frame, others. And then later your own, because 
often due to budget constraints, that's how it began, that you started shooting photographs, traditional portraits, like that little one in the corner on fire, and this one in West is West, we took in-house, so, and, they, and they are shots that went into the frame. And then, these are this is a photograph I took, which went into a film set, and so, and this one, into another film set. So in a sense, the, the, the film itself was my first gallery, by default, I guess, but it's remained one right throughout the practice. And I'd like to show you a body of work, which is called In the No Zone. I'm going to show you a few tiny bits from my various bodies of work that have nothing to do with film, even though the idea might have been seeded while I was on a film set. In some cases, and in some cases, they're totally thought up without anything to do with the film set. Um, this one is called In the No Zone. For me, it's always the joy of traveling, but sometimes you see there's a lot of panic around you about it as well. These are sort of uninhabited spaces. This is uh, actually an uh, image that I remember constantly because it's uh, taken in Goa and it's of a woman who had left her clothes while she was taken to the old age home where she passed away. But they left this dress, these two dresses for the next couple of years and when I went to her house they were still hanging there as it was when she had lived there. Um, this body, I mean, it's got a working title. It's called Will the Frogs Survive? And it's mostly about construction and real estate and the ideas of how much of, of land value. This is a show house. This is very interrelated with the film work because when you're working on a film set, you go to multiple locations and very often empty spaces. And I realized um, for every house that we shoot in, we look at about 20. This is a series called Private Spaces.
small things. I think they're the big ones, really. So I've been doing these little visual haikus. So if you had a visual haiku of less than or 17 syllables or less uh, with a couple of photographs, and I'll show you just a, two, three of them. And another haiku with just three photographs. and one with just one photograph. Um, I thought I'd also introduce you to some of the photography that we did on the, on the Darjeeling Limited that I did of the sets. You normally have a still photographer on the film set who photographs the action that takes place on set. But this was my own sub-story as the sets were being constructed and while we were in these spaces. So this is what we always begin with, of course, the canvas, the studio floor, or a location. And we've been through uh, a location in the earlier one. So this is our empty slate. And then you begin the process of shooting. So this is the Darjeeling Limited, and this is the train that we were preparing for the film shoot. Um, and then I'm going to show you a series of the engine and various other parts of the train. And the platform that we created. And then it's self-explicit, self it's the engine, the dining car, the bedroom, the master cabin, the caboose, and exterior shots of the train. And I keep going from long shot to close up because as a designer, your eye keeps going to the large frame and then coming to the small frame to see what the cameraman can see and also to try and put in as much as you can into his frame. By moving objects or trying to re get somebody to do a last minute elephant This is also from the Darjeeling Limited. I decided to stay with one film so that we could walk through the process of filmmaking and the process of capturing your own story while the film is being made. So this is when the, these, these boys are actually um, capsizing and going to, one of them is going to unfortunately get drowned. But we built a huge um, metal structure under water, which we placed under water. Of, wi of which they would um, be tied to, onto which they were being they were tied to, and so when they capsized, they wouldn't go that far. And we created a float that they capsized off. But it was mainly these photographs mainly to show the kind of what happens in the kind of action scenes on a film set, and also in the danger of it.
it's a funeral at the f at on shoot. This is the convent which we saw right at the start where we had the cross, where we built this 35 foot cross and photographed it every day while it was being built. And I'll show you that at the end. So it's sort of interesting to create the image that you're also photographing. You're creating the set, you're creating it for the camera frame, and you're also creating it for your own photographs. the bedroom within the convent and the adja room adjacent to the bedroom. And on the film there was a second train called the Bengal Lancers, which we also made up and shot in another part of Rajasthan. And I'd like to end with the montage shot and also the model, the idea of creating the space that eventually becomes the set. And you can see it here. This is the model in the studio in New York. And this is the actual shoot day when we are shooting with the characters and the actors. And this is what we made. I think we'll end with the tiger. Is that, you know, the, the, there's got to be a tension between, uh, you know, as a production designer, there has to be a tension between wanting to do a set that is, on the one hand, quintessential, exactly like, you know, almost stereotypical, <coughs> on the one hand, and being quirky and different and interesting on the other hand. How do you, how do you move between those two poles? It must be a challenge. When you first get the script and read it, you make copious notes. In fact, that's the time that you get the most amount of, ins I mean, you get your main inspiration before you even meet the director, preferably, actually, because the director has its own ideas. And this way you take the story and see it through your lens. And then you go in for a meeting, most more often than not, with the director and discuss with him or her what their ideas are and what your ideas are. And you get a good sense. I mean, with Wes, it was very easy because he, he's very definite in his way of thinking. But he's also very flexible if he thinks you have a good idea. And there were three of us actually really doing the main design for Darjeeling Limited the designer and two art directors. And he, there was a huge amount of communication with him because he understood that we understood. In fact, for the train, they wanted to start by getting an artist, a uh, studio artist in. 
and I think quite soon it moved to signage painters and truck painters. <coughs> so you understand that he will take that on. But there are some filmmakers who won't, and some of it is obviously historical, so you have to be a bit careful about how quirky you can be to understand the period and see if you can be quirky in it. Like for Earth, it was impossible really to be quirky because it was a period film that you were trying to understand what was going on then. And the director was also not open to it, even though you try and put it in in little bits into the child's character, maybe into the child's bedroom. Give her some quirkiness. Aradhana said is the biggest hoarder I know. She's the biggest hoarder of visual reference material. She's, she's got tickets that go back 35 years to when I first got to know. Does that have anything to do with your craft and the way you work, I think, as a photographer? And the way you work in, in cinema, can you talk about I, I think I was a general scrapbook maker and a jotter and a hoarder from the time I was little and a furniture rearranger in people's houses. I never remembered what they wore, but I always remembered all their table or their carpet or something that was out of place. But, uh, and I started, I think, hoarding when I was <laughs> quite young in, I guess, just keeping memorabilia. And now I hoard because I always think I might need it on a film set. Or I might need it for a photo shoot. Or I might need it when I'm making some work, photographic work, and I might want to arrange all of it. So the hoarding is coming in very, it's super handy, except that with real estate being the way it is, I think the hoarding will stop at some time, at some point. How do you see your work progressing now? I mean, do you see yourself doing as much cinema work as you've always done? Do you see photography taking over? Do you see installations and exhibitions as being more of something you want to do? I think they'll, they'll go parallelly. They kind of, they're, they're separate and yet often they feed off each other. So I think uh, they're going to continue going hand in hand with each other. I think the documentary filmmaking is reduced. Why do you think documentary cinema will now take a back seat for you? What is your I think that um, that energy and time spent doing documentary has gone into the photographic practice. Because um, I, I think I take that, and I think all that has moved into this. Is it, um, I have the impression that you're not really using high-tech, big cameras. You're using quite small cameras. It's almost as though you're not really interested in the technicality of it, but the image itself. Is that, is that, is that generally true, you think, or not particularly? I'm using, I'm using both. Uh, often I'm using, um, I mean, I started off obviously with a film camera, and now I use digital a lot. And um, when I'm wandering around at locations, it's, it's normally the little Leica because you can shoot quickly and move on very fast. You, have, you go to 10 places in a day, you have 15 minutes to shoot the place and discuss with the director whether it's a good location for Mr. Mm, you know, Mr. Chopra's house. And uh, so while that is happening, you use, I'm using that, but when I'm, say, Traveling, I tend to use the bigger camera much more. Or when I'm going on assignment or feel that I want to make this body of work other than when I'm working on a film and using it as like a jotting. I want to ask you one question which may not be easy to answer. What, what happens when you find yourself at fundamental odds with the director who wants something very different to what you want to offer them as a production designer? How, how, how does that get resolved? Is it simply a tussle of strength? You think about uh, the overall vision. You understand what he wants as an overall vision. And if you feel that his ideas um, are worth following, then you go with it. And if you don't, then you try to put forward your own ideas and so it's you, you also worked with a incredible range of types of films haven't you mm. and from out and out bollywood to stuff that really has nothing to you know to art cinema 
do you want to talk a little bit about the differences and what it's like to work in these very different um, climates? I mean, does your work change? Does the way you work change with these people? The way you work always remains um, the same because you, you go through the process of breaking down a script. But um, obviously, you have a very large budget on, say, the Bond Supremacy or Darjeeling Limited, and you have a tiny budget on a film that's just coming out now called Angry Indian Goddesses. And so you work, you create a lot more material. You self-create a lot more material and, in fact, a lot of photographs and a lot of art material for the smaller films. And you tend to procure a lot of material for the larger films. No, but what when the sensibility is totally different? What if it's out and out Bollywood, for example? If it's embarrassing, you can you can say pass. I wonder if they. Yeah. I mean, like Wes Anderson, his storytelling is. I mean, of course, the narrative is important, but the way that the narrative is delivered, visually as well as like in terms of audio, is so important in his films, particularly, and like there's so. All of his, like when you know when you're watching a Wes Anderson film. So since I'm using his example since that's what you were showing the yeah. most. So do you find like you have to, I mean how, since you create the images that you take in the photo, like you said, you create what yourself, whatever you're taking. How, how is it that you do that? I mean like how much of pushing and pulling is there? And like how do you find that kind of a middle ground where you are also happy with what you create and so is the person that you're creating it for? I think that process happens in the early stages before you come to the set, if you have time. I mean, that's also critical. And you, you visualize it and you basically put it forward. In the early days, I think, like, you know, during Ray, he did so much himself. Whereas now they, in a way, hire people to do that work. So you go with a whole bunch of ideas to someone as specific as Wes. The other directors are not that specific, they, but with him, you go with a, to him with a bunch of ideas. And you work your way through what you think he wants to what you think, say, a film which is shot in India can offer and amalgamate the two. And whereas with the others, the other many Bombay directors, always want to look at a reference, which is a very odd kind of thing for me. I also tell them, <laughs> I've also said that, because if you're hiring a production designer, you really want them to be able to create something new for you. And Bombay works a lot on this reference-based system. So you see something in a book, and you say, Let, I'll have that as a set. You see something else, and you'll say, let's amalgamate that. So. That process, I mean, I work a lot less in Mumbai because I want to create original material and original sets. And so that process is something that you negotiate and design and actually make architectural plans and show all the samples and almost go with a totally designed set and try to offer it up as a fait accompli, kind of. And then they might say, yeah, change the green or no, what about the yellow or something like that. But you go with a lot of homework done. You basically do your homework. You do everything that you can. You make a super presentation, and you try to do the set and within that budget. So you have to also manage how much it's going to cost if it's a built set or if it's at a location. I don't know if it's interesting for everybody at the photo festival, since it's so much about film. but. You know, since you're talking about that, you know, it's more of photographers, uh, I mean, photography festival here. You know, the struggle for, uh, if you can give, reflect on this, usually, you know, photography being such a personal business as you think, as you operate, as you photograph. And when you get into a situation, and I think the craziest one is, you know, uh, on the other side is the film business. Mm. And there you're trying to bring those two together. So there must be certain kind of, uh, uh, you know, struggle at times where you have a certain way how you want to put it, but you know the larger picture which has to come through, you know? For, for me, I uh, try very hard to make the set that I want to make, and I find as many ways as I can. But you're right that 
One is with hundreds and hundreds of people around you, and the other is really a solitary profession. So I kind of move between the two. I, I like that, actually. I like this idea of being alone and going off and making work, and then on the flip of it, just being with hundreds of people around you, and there's a kind of madness in the every day of that. Is that what you were asking? Or I, I'm, yeah? It's, it is, yeah. But I actually feel that if you can balance it. In the beginning, I wasn't balancing it so well, though I was doing a balance between documentary and fiction at that time, and doing some amount of photography. And, where, and that was also with four people. You made a documentary film with four people. You made a feature film with 400 people, 4,000 people. I mean, it was, it was madness. But on the, um, I like the I like the balance of it. Though I, I I must admit that I like to have my own time a lot more. I mean I like the solitude more now than I did before. I think that's a question of when you get a bit older. If there are no more questions, um, I'll ask one last one. Can yeah, I? Yeah, sure, please. Have you have you forged a relationship with the director? You know, in the way that some directors have. Favorite cameraman, DOPs, mm -hmm. favorite actors. Do you have a relationship with any director that you worked with as a as a as a mm -hmm. production designer, mm -hmm. where you think you will work again and again and again with them and evolve with them? Has that happened to you? I worked repeatedly with uh, a couple. I mean, with a couple of that. Well, actually, just one director really, Deepa Mehta, and the others I haven't worked with them again because either I've been busy or I've been wanting to make. I won't work, or they haven't made any more films, or etc. Pradeep is the first director I ever worked with. So, and then actually, you did make one more. Um, but uh, I'm okay actually about going to new zones. I'm sometimes done if I've done three films on the partition or repeatedly work with one director because they have a particular style, and part of my idea of working as a production designer, is to work on new stuff. And unless the director is somebody who really changes a lot, it's quite wonderful to actually work with different kinds of directors. Do you want to ask something, Finish. No, I just wanted to tell everyone that uh, Radna's designed and produced the uh, installation of uh, Pratik Sarkar's work, right? Uh, which is the work which is shown on the left of the Mardi Ghar. So it would be great for you to go and see that too. Uh, that's yet another aspect of what Aradhana does besides a dozen other things which we've heard about. Thank you so much, Aradhana. Thank you, Pradeep. need to rely on the people who are working with you to a much greater extent, a much greater degree, than would otherwise perhaps have been the case if you had an ample budget. And Aradna made a superb, superb AD. Um, one of a very small band of people who actually worked to br hold that film together and bring it in. Um, we used to call her Jamia, um, because together with two or three other people on the crew, there were these fresh-faced, young students out of the Jamia Millia um, Center for Mass Communication, which at that moment of time, 1988, was probably the only, am I right, the only institute in Delhi at that time was churning out people who were heading for cinema. But I think we were all a little worried that they were coming straight from a school into the frying pan, that they were still a little wet behind the ears, that they hadn't really earned their spurs, actually working on a film with all the the kinds of films, the kinds of places that were visited by young aspiring filmmakers to look for work would be, of course, Doordarshan, but also the UGC, the University Grants Commission, some other public sector undertaking, perhaps. You know, and if you were very, very lucky, then perhaps something like UNICEF. But it was a very, very tough thing to be setting out to become a documentary filmmaker. But Aradna said at that time, and like a lot of other young people, took her chances picked up little bits of documentary work, and um, you know, I asked Aradna before this talk, I said, you know, will you send me your list of films that you've done? And it's actually a astonishing 
document. It would take me 10 minutes to read out all the titles. Um, and it's, it's also the most incredibly varied uh, filmography you can imagine. It ranges from the diary of an Anganwari worker to a juvenile justice documentary for the University Grants Commission to a film on Insat 1B. It's really the most amazing list. Grime and dust and tension and you know all that goes with, with filmmaking. Well, they, they did earn their spurs. All of them were actually quite superb. But, and this particular Jamia um, was special. And um, we became very good friends and I remember being really disappointed when roughly a year and a half later, she wasn't actually available to work on my next film uh, in 1990. Now, I think what should be of interest to a lot of young people working in the field today is that this period, 1988, 1989, 1990, was actually a very, very difficult time in our country to be trying to become a filmmaker. Um, if you were to ask Aradna what she was actually doing in 1990 or 1991, you'll find that along with a lot of other people, they were literally scrounging for work, scrounging in a way that perhaps young people today would not even understand. Um, she's made over 20 documentaries in all, most of it, but my, by no means all of it in the early phase of her career. And this was really just the tip of the iceberg in her case. Now, I don't know if Aradna remembers this, but sometime in the mid-90s, or perhaps a little later, we were discussing her work in film. And without thinking too much about it, certainly it wasn't a premeditated thought. I said, I asked her, I said, have you ever thought of working in the art department of a, of a movie? And perhaps, I'm not sure, but perhaps I just felt that good people weren't beating a path towards the art department, that this was one area, especially in new cinema, that wasn't populated by people uh, in India who, were, who made good art directors. And, um, you know, 20 years later, the result is that Aradna Seth now has 20 films, believe it or not, under her belt. The first few as an art director and then subsequent Hello, everybody. I'm just going to say a few words to introduce Aradna to an audience of what I think is mostly young people and aspiring photographers, which I think is just the right kind of audience. She's actually, I find, quite hard to put into a box, to find a rubric to describe the kind of work she does, because she actually does so many different things. I, I first met Aradna when she um, appeared for a job as an assistant director, an AD, on a film that I was doing in 1988. The film was called In Which Annie Gives It Those Ones. Um, and this was a small budget film, uh, almost a no budget film. And as nearly always happens when you work with really small, tiny budgets, um, you tend to 